Hi, hey, y'all. Uh, my name is Bree Helton, and I'm here today on Studio 3 of the uh, Diana Initiative 2021 uh, virtual event. I uh, just wanted to give a warm um, welcome to everyone who's attending this talk today, and I want to introduce um, several of our track sponsors before getting into the talk and such. Um, sponsoring this track today is eLearn Security, uh, Nonix, uh, MongoDB, Juniper, Correlate, Google, we Hack Purple and Bridge Crew. Um, several of these uh, sponsors have vendor booths set up in the expo hall if you want to go ahead and attend, attend those and take a look at them. Um, also, before we get into our talk, I just want to make a, a shout out to anyone who's currently watching this event within our conference system. Uh, if you take a look on the left hand side, you'll see that there are a number of different options for different places you can visit outside the talks themselves. Um, there is also a vendor expo and um, various sessions, including our mental health hackers, our CT and several other organizations that are currently presenting across today. So if you have some time outside the talks, please uh, give some attention and love to anyone else um, that has their stuff set up and they'll be happy to speak with you and such today. Um, and without further ado, I wanted to hand it off over here to Tara Cook uh, for them to do their introduction and give their talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bree. All right, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you are in the world. I wanna say thank you so much for joining me on this good Saturday or Sunday, again, depending on where you are, so we can talk about NIST, one of my favorite topics. Um, so as it goes, my name is Tara Cook, it is July 17th, and my topic today is let's simplify NIST 853, turning everyone's favorite publication to digestible bits and bytes. With that, I'm gonna click over here to where my slides actually are and move this thing along. So. Who am I? Um, again, my name is Tara Cook. I like to uh, call myself a security magical girl or Olivia Pope without all the mess because cleaning things up is something that I do, but I also just like saying that I'm a magical girl because anime. Um, I am a former still slash kind of sort of still a governance, risk and compliance and audit nerd. Um, that is where a good chunk of my heart honestly sits. I know a lot of people don't like auditors, but we're great, I promise. I also used to work in the intelligence community. That is a fun time and a very quick thing that we always just like right on over. Um, I am very unapologetically black and I am huge on pushing for intersectionality and equity in the security and tech world. And as I do call out that I am very black and I think it goes without saying as far as what it means to me in my life to always call out in these forums that black lives matter and that includes the lives of black women, black trans women, black LGBTQ women, femme adjacent folks, women adjacent folks. Um, and if we have a lot of work to do as far as dismantling white supremacy and these things in the world before we can really make progress. It means a lot to me if you do your part in making sure that we do that. With that being said, I'm gonna keep going. So why are we here? Um, we're here to talk about NIST, like I said earlier. Um, my whole goal is to ultimately take this framework that is very huge and kind of clunky, and this is not me uh, knocking NIST, I love them to death. But if you're starting out in your career and you have heard about it, I think it's a great time for us to discuss the different family slash categories, what do they mean, how they might show up in your environment, and if you're an auditor, how to audit them, although you know it's not bad for anybody to audit things. Answer any questions, and you know, while the pandemic is still pandemicking, enjoy everybody's virtual company. So why should you care about NIST? I mean, that's at your discretion. Um, I care about it because it was and has continued to be very crucial for me in my career. Um, and even if it's not directly called out, I personally think that we touch NIST 853 or at least the control families on a daily basis. And that's whether you work in security, whether you work in engineering, development, et cetera. Um, it's something that we all touch. I think it builds a solid foundation for your career, no matter, again, where you're working in your career. And when you go and start to look through NIST and digest it, and yes, I have read all, I have no how many pages of it, um, it helps folks speak a common language. And I think in the world of security and engineering specifically, us uh, speaking a common language is super important because it gives us um, an understanding on how we can move forward. And like I said earlier, I think NIST is super cool. And so I like talking about it. And I also like talking about uh, subjects that are, they can be very arduous, very time consuming, very large. Um, so I think it's cool. And I want to share the good NIST word. So what is NIST 853? I should probably even start off with saying, what does NIST stand for? So that is the National Institute 
Institute of Standards and Technology based out of Gaithersburg, Maryland. There's also a NIST here in Colorado because that's where I live. Um, but it is pretty much NIST 853 to be very specific. It is the Federal Information Systems Controls. I totally forgot. I actually, I think I also just blurred in a couple of different um, frameworks, but it is something used primarily in federal systems, um, but it can be good for any industry. The way it's set up is you have a control um, that is being talked about or addressed, and then under there you have different categories between low, medium, and high, because again, the federal space, you can put that particular classification to your system, and then it has other specifications to meet that low, medium, and high. Um, it ultimately helps increase the security of information systems, again, going back to that low, medium, high. It does a focus around confidentiality, integrity, availability, as well as operational, technical, and management controls. So covering the CIA platform, as well as giving you um, a brevity of different ways to implement controls, because while just doing things at the technical level is super sweet, um, it doesn't always address everything that you need. But more importantly, and as I've said multiple times, um, it's a lot to process and a lot to intake. And if you are someone new to security and you're told, hey, like, boop, here goes the nest 853, go have fun, um, which is what happened to me. You can just be like, all right, I don't even know what to do with this or where to start. So for me, I try and think about my past self. And I think this would have been really cool to view as a baby security engineer. Um, so NIST has something called control families. And if memory serves correct at the Rev 5, so uh, revision 5, which I think was super recently, it's 20 or 25 families. Um, I probably should have counted again before I did this presentation, but I didn't. Anyway, those all are access control, awareness and training, auditing and accountability, assessment, authorization and monitoring, configuration management, continuity planning, identification and authentication, incident response, maintenance, media protection, physical and environmental protection, Planning, program management, personnel security, personally identifiable information processing and transparency, which is a whole mouthful, um, risk assessment, system and services acquisition, system and communications protection, system and information integrity, and last but not least, supply chain risk management. So like I said, lots of different control families. Some of them, when you read the name, you're like, oh, okay, this is pretty straightforward with what it should mean. Um, some of them, not so much. And even still, it's always nice to have a definition to tackle onto something just so you're generally like, okay, cool, this is what I'm aiming towards. But as you will see as I go through this, actually, not everything has a definition. And that's okay, because I put in my slides the NIST definition, my definition, and then again, some ways you might see it pop up. So let's get this thing going. Access control. So the NIST definition is procedures and controls that limit or detect access to critical information resources. Um, I will stop there because then it gives some different examples on what that could look like. The way I try and look at access control is understanding who has access to something and is that, well, understanding who has access to something, is that access valid and why? Um, it's very important to understand is that access valid and why? Uh, the reason why I say that is, you know, it's great if someone can, for instance, you know, access your house or access the back of your yard, but should they be accessing, accessing it is one thing and why are they doing it is another. Um, as you go through and start looking at different systems, as we look at the ways that it can appear with account management, so you're enabling and disabling your accounts, your least privilege, which is only giving someone access to what they need to do their job and then restricted access. So an example is like HR only being able to see HR files, that ties back into me as a security engineer, I should not have access to um, anybody's HR files just by the nature of my job, it's not necessary. If I happen to have access though, why is it valid? So how deeply can I see someone's files and why is it important? Um, do I have access as a security person because I something, um, it was an ungracious person leaving, not an ungracious person leaving, it was an unceremonious, Someone got fired there, boom, we can say it like that. Someone got fired. So do I have access to make sure that, you know, everything is closed out in a certain way or, you know, somebody in finance having access to certain files, so on and so forth. Um, it is very important to reiterate on that um, access being valid or why, or thinking about even just like Wi-Fi. Um, someone could totally have access to your wife or your access point, for instance. Um, but did you change the password to the one that was on the box? So they now don't have valid access and why they have it is because the password, they knew it and it was easy. Um, awareness and training. Oh my gosh, I totally did not change this in my slide and I'm very ashamed of myself. Anyway, um, 
the NIST definition, I don't remember. I don't think NIST actually had one. Um, my definitions of awareness and training is making sure you train up your people on, you know, what they're supposed to be doing for their job. What that can look like is your security awareness training, which everyone loves. I know we do. Um, or very job specific training. So for instance, at my current company um, that I work at, we have some secure code training for our developers available. Um, and that just helps them, you know, beef up their skills around developing secure code. So that's some job training. Or um, I'm trying to think of some other ways that it can appear, but I think people understand the gist of awareness and training. Please say that I changed it. Okay, great. Um, I was very afraid that I somehow did not update all my slides or forgot to. Um, but auditing and account, or excuse me, audit and accountability. Um, NIST doesn't have a definition for that, but what that looks like is who did what, when did they do it, and does it make sense? So it ties back into that whole aspect of access control a little bit, if you can't tell how these things all play off of each other. Um, ways that that can appear is event logging. So when you see someone signs in and that's being sent off somewhere, log retention, making sure things are being retained based off of different obligations you might have, depending on what industry that you work in. And then non-repudiation is a person like without a shadow of a doubt, that person is who they say they are and can prove it. Um, so again, going back to who did what, when, and does it make sense? The way I try and think about that is, you know, maintenance. And you actually see this coming into a different side as well. Um, but you want to be able to, you know, if you live in an apartment complex and you submit a maintenance request, you would hope that your complex has, you know, some logs showing like, oh, okay, Tara submitted a request. Yep, we got that request. We submitted it to the maintenance person um, and they're going to be going to their apartment at XYZ time. So you can see when that key was checked out, you know when that person came in, it gives you a warm and fuzzy because you know when they did it and it does make sense that that person did it versus if there were no logs and people were just going in and out of your apartment willy nilly, where's the audit and accountability and especially the accountability part. So assessment authorization and monitoring. And also, um, I forgot to point out, uh, there are abbreviations to each of these control families. So the way a control is usually written, it'll be CA-1 or AC-1, so on and so forth, depending on how many different controls are in that family. Um, but the NIST definition, there isn't one. My definition is your third party assessments, your system motor assignment, and then your continuous monitoring that you have. Um, so that can look like, your SOC, or excuse me, I totally just forgot what C stands for, but SOC, not SOC as in like security or, I, man, words are hard on Saturday, but whatever. SOC audits, penetration tests, remediation plans, and then your various internal scanning, whether that's with Nessus or pick your vulnerability tool of your choice. Um, it's worth pointing out that when it comes down to the system owner assignment, that's something that you see a lot in the federal space. So it might not be something that you see particularly in your environment, but it is always super important to have owners to your different systems, even if it's just a matter of going back to accountability and having someone that you can talk to to say like, hey, this thing broke or, hey, we have this major problem. It's very important to have an owner to things to talk to. Um, so configuration management or CM. NIST defines that as a collection of activities focused on establishing and maintaining the integrity of information technology products and information systems through control of processes for initializing, changing, and monitoring the configurations of those products and systems throughout the system development lifecycle, which is a mouthful and lots of like nice buzzwords and stuff. Um, the way that I look at it is establishing baselines and controlling system changes in a uniform manner. The way you'll see that could be a change control board, which is a group of people um, meeting to discuss different system changes, change restrictions around least privilege. So the person who creates the code may not actually be the person, you know, the only person reviewing it and then pushing it. And then your baseline snapshots to, and so to try to think about that in like regular world, if you happen to live in a community that has an HOA, which I know everybody totally loves the HOA, um, before you can do any changes like to the outside of your home, you usually have to go talk to the HOA, which could be a change control board, right? Right. Um, and you have like cookie cutter houses that all look the same, or you all have like the same sorts of plants or those things. That's controlling your system in a uniform manner. That is establishing a baseline that we all have to adhere to. And we have to go talk to people before you can go through and change that. So that's how I like the thing about configuration management in a non-technical world sense, because one of the other reasons I personally 
decided to do this talk was to kind of demystify some of the things that we talk about and deal with in security and in engineering as a whole. I personally, you don't have to be a wizard to know security. Um, a lot of this stuff is very applicable to our everyday real life. Just have to do some thing dangling um, to take it from tech into things that we can tangibly touch. Um, so keep chugging along contingency planning. Um, that is defined as a management policy or excuse me, management policy and procedure used to guide an enterprise response to a perceived loss of mission capability. I say it's a player for when poop hits the fan, realistically speaking. Um, I mean, who would have thought that we're almost a year and a half into a pandemic that no one probably assumed that we would go through in our lifetime. And so companies had to very quickly pivot to their contingency plan to understand how do we keep functioning now that poop has hit the fan and everyone has to work from home and we don't really know what to do. So that's one way that it can appear. Um, but some other ways is a disaster recovery plan. Um, it's worth calling out that disaster recovery rolls into contingency planning and DR very specifically tends to focus on the technology recovery. Um, contingency plan incorporates your people, processes, and technologies. And so having backups around your people, processes, and technologies and a big, big focus on the people part of things. And then doing the business impact analysis, which is dissecting the impact for if or when something isn't available, which again goes back into understanding contingencies. Um, identification and authentication. NIST doesn't have a definition. I think about it around who and what uh, I, there's a Deborah Cox song for anybody who likes Deborah Cox or R&B, especially from the 90s. And when she says, how did you get here? Nobody's supposed to be here. So who are you and how did you get here? Um, not to be confused with, are you supposed to actually be here? So identification is very uh, straightforward. You are saying, yep, I'm this person. And then you authenticate using something like multi-factor authentication or your secure shell, secure shell, and I spelled that wrong, but that's fine. So your SSH keys. Uh, going back to the example about maintenance, um, you expect them to have a badge, which is a form of identification, which I know a badge is not always perfect and things can be spoofed, but that's okay. Um, so you have them identify themselves and they have access to your if he has, or pardon me, a maintenance person has access to literally like everyone's apartment in a building by the nature of their job. So cool, great. Um, but are they actually authenticated to enter your apartment? That's when it becomes debatable because that goes into, well, is it valid that they're here? Are you actually supposed to be here? Um, access control is super fun and there's lots of intersections as you can see. Um, but yeah, identifying and authenticating, you can be authenticated to be there, but that doesn't mean that you, or you can have access, but doesn't mean that you're actually authenticated to be doing that thing. Um, incident response. So NIST defines that as the mitigation of violation of security policies and recommended practices. I think it's just a type of response to poop hitting the fan. So IR can fall under contingency planning. Um, depending on what sort of thing is hitting the fan, you might go from an incident to disaster recovery or an incident to having to run your continuity plan or incident to disaster recovery to continuity plan. It all definitely just depends. Um, I think a lot of folks lately in the world have also seen um, IR in action with all the different ransomware attacks um, that have been happening. So shout out to the IR teams and adjacent folks who are, have been handling that. You're the real MVPs. Um, it can be really long nights or just following up with some suspicious activity. Um, like I mentioned, it's a thing that falls up under contingency planning, which is totally cool. Maintenance. That is defined by NIST as any act that either prevents the failure or malfunction of equipment or restores its operating capability. I define that as just as we have to do maintenance in real life, keeping your systems right and tight with regular old tune-ups. Um, you might see that in your environment by cycling your laptops every three years, checking and replacing fire extinguishers because physical security is just as important, if not more so, and then hiring a professional third party to check your specialized equipment. So if you live in a place, you have a car, your own human body, we all have to do maintenance on it. it it's pretty straightforward, to be quite honest. Media protection. NIST did not give a definition there. Um, I define it as the safety of your physical media. It can be, you know, who can actually access your physical hard drives if you um, have your stuff in a data center, whether that's networking equipment, physical hard drives, etc. Um, destroying your physical media when you're done with it. So thinking back to good old CDs, um, destroying them in whatever way, shape, form, or fashion. 
or also marking media with proper classification. This is another thing that's super big in the federal space. Um, obviously making sure it has its proper classification, whether that's you know secret, top secret, whatever, and then also following through on whatever procedures it takes to remove that data from that physical media storage. But even in the non-federal space, if you are putting like PHI, for instance, on any sort of physical media, you do want to make sure that one, it is classified as such, and two, you are destroying that physical media or getting rid of it, whether it's whatever way that works in your environment, you are following that process. Um, physical and environmental protection, something that is huge and massive and often not looked over, or excuse me, it's often not talked about enough and very much looked over. Um, NIST does not have a definition for that, but I view it as protecting your physical space and ensuring your safety. Um, when we talk about physical security, obviously the first thing that comes to mind and is the most important is the physical security of your people. And so that's something to always bear in mind when you're talking about your physical security controls. Um, ways that might be able to appear in your environment is having visitor logs, whether that's them just signing a paper or using a system where they, you know, get their picture taken and then you have a record that way. Um, your cameras, your fences, your locks, and then also getting that regular maintenance on, understanding your power, your um, heating and cooling, fire protection, so your fire extinguishers. Uh, obviously, physical security is important in every aspect of life, not just something that you should look at when you're in your office environment. And especially with the whole work from home life thing, it also has caused people to take a way deeper look into physical security um, at the individual level, as well as the company level, especially depending on what your industry is. Planning, my favorite thing, or one of my favorite things. So this does not give us a definition of that, but that's cool. Um, I think it's laying down your foundations, document and account for all of the things. And there is a little caveat there. Obviously, you can't document for all the things. I think if we could, um, some of us would, depending on how your brain works around planning. Um, so documenting for as many things that make sense and as possible, you're going to miss things. That's totally OK, um, as well as thinking about like planning in your company of what you're doing for the next quarter, the next half, the next year, et cetera. Um, the way that can totally appear, though, is different types of policies, your company rule books, and like I mentioned, literally planning for your projects or what have you. Program management, near and dear to my heart, because that is a function that I work in right now. Um, this does not give a definition there, but the way I think of it is executing projects and opera, opera, no, I can never say the word, even though I always put it in my slides, that O word, um, improvements at scale, um, a little bit of a star at scale, because what you can do in a small space, you may not be able to do as your team or company starts to grow. So it's always great to have um, processes in place that you can hopefully expand upon as you start to grow. Um, ways that can appear as a program management office, um, your key performance metrics or indicators, or um, your objectives and key results, AKA OKRs, which is something that is super near and dear to my heart right now. Um, and then your enterprise wide and cross functional initiatives. So your security awareness training, your continuity planning, because that is something that needs to be done in every part of your company that ultimately supports your enterprise. Um, those sorts of things definitely benefit from having um, groups of people that work together that understand a fundamental process that can hopefully be, you know, done at the enterprise and then also um, shared downwards. Personnel security. Uh, NIST defines that as the discipline of assessing the conduct, integrity, judgment, loyalty, reliability, and stability of individuals for duties and responsibilities requiring trustworthiness. Short definition is know your people and who you're hiring in the grand scheme of things. Obviously, depending on where you work or what industry you work, that means a lot of different things, but most places will do something like a background check, having onboarding and offboarding procedures, and then having safe reporting channels. Obviously, it's important to know um, people and who you're hiring and whatnot, but there are still fine lines to make sure people are having their own privacy in the world. Um, so again, depending on what industry you're in, this could look like a total, like a bunch of different things, but it's still important to do. Um, personally identifiable information, also known as PII, processing and transparency, or PT. This does not have a definition. Um, my definition is protecting sensitive information from those who shouldn't have it. I know um, 
part of this battle, which is really hard, is just defining what is sensitive information or defining what is personally identifiable information. Um, something like a name could totally be PII, um, but then when you start to aggregate certain information on people, so you have first name, last name, email address, IP address, phone number, so on and so forth, um, it starts to become a way bigger deal. So that is helped by defining um, a data classification policy and procedures, um, having your internal and external privacy notices for those who may use your product or in general, and then having end user consent records and logic logging, um, thinking about the great GDPR of 2017, 2018, put a huge focus on personally identifiable information for people obviously who live in the EU, but I think it calls a lot of companies to actually take a step back and start looking at the privacy of their consumers and going through the process of understanding what is PII and what protections are we gonna put around it, as well as the processing of that information, who's able to access it internally, externally, um, and what they're ultimately doing with it. So yay for better privacy controls. I'm a huge, huge component of that. Uh, risk assessment. NIST has a definition that is pretty long, but it is the process of identifying risk and organizational operations, such as including mission, function, missions, functions, image, reputation, organizational aspects, individuals, other organizations, and the nation, which is a huge sign that this is a federal thing, um, resulting from the operation of an information system. The way I look at it, and this is a lot shorter to me, is do we want to do a thing? And if so, what's the impact of that thing? Uh, thinking about that, obviously, in your company, do you want to push out a certain change? Do you want to do a certain feature? If we do this, what's going to be the impact of it? Um, is it going to have an impact to us as a company? Is it going to have an impact to our consumers? Are we potentially opening up a security risk here? If someone, you know, actually, or let me rephrase, from a security standpoint, are we opening up or increasing the threshold of which a threat might take place or um, a vulnerability could be acted upon and then we have a problem. Um, but you can totally put risk in a risk register, which is something where all risks are documented and reviews, reviewed, have a business impact analysis or a privacy impact analysis. Um, I think a lot of people get scared when they think about risk and risk assessments or that you need to be like super specialized to do it. I don't think that's the case in all actuality. Um, we do a lot of risk work in our everyday lives. For instance, if you drive a car or if you take a bus, lift, what have you, um, you're doing a risk assessment in your head then. It's, do I wanna take my car or do I wanna take the bus? Well, I have insurance for my car, so if I get in an accident, like the risk of me having to pay a bunch of money, depending on the different ways that your insurance is set up, could be minimized or should be minimized. Well, if I take a bus and something happens, then I just have to get off the bus, hopefully, and like everything's cool, right, right, right. So, or again, during the pandemic, we all had to do risk assessment literally on a day-by-day -day basis of, do I go see this person or no? Do I stay in my house? Do I go get groceries? Do I have my groceries delivered to me? Um, not to be super doomy and gloomy about the pandemic, but Again, I think risk assessments are something that we should talk about a lot more as people because we do them a lot. It's just a matter of translating the, <laughs> doing the opposite of what I mentioned before and taking the tangible things we can touch and put them in a cyber digital bits and boops sort of space. Um, system services and acquisition. So this does not have a definition of that. The way I look at it is assessing a system or a service or a company before merging environments or acquiring them. So again, merging environments or what have you. Uh, the way that that can appear is a security or privacy assessment, pre-acquisition, understanding their system and engineering principles, doing documentation reviews. Um, this is a pretty huge deal in the grand scheme of things, especially if you're going through an acquisition. Um, if you're gonna treat that company as kind of like its own little separate thing, that's super cool. Um, but you still wanna understand what's going on in their environment, especially if you're gonna be responsible Possible for it. If you're going to be acquiring them and actually doing a like a true merge of environments, you do want to understand how that is going to impact things and how much your environment is ultimately going to change. And again, what sort of um, security threshold, not security threshold um, space are you now opening up by merging the two environments together? I think I'm pretty close to the end. I think I'm also good on time. Um, but system and communications protection. This does not have a definition there. Um, the way I look at it is allowing systems to speak to each other, but from a distance. So virtual social distancing. Um, that can be viewed as boundary protection. So keeping your sensitive resources behind a protected wall of sorts. Um, having trusted paths. So systems that have been vetted by the engineers to say like, yep, they can totally talk to each other. And then your public key infrastructure, aka the PKI infrastructure, or PKIs, 
Um, also something that's super important when you start to think about federal systems, of course, but it's another form of access, access control in the grand scheme of things, but it's no longer the focus on the human accessing things, but systems actually being able to access each other, transfer information to one another, et cetera. Then you have system information, excuse me, system and information integrity. There's no definition from this, but I think it's maintaining system reputation and trustworthiness. That can be done by doing your vulnerability scanning and monitoring, having your remediation plans, and then doing input validation, which is ensuring someone's input won't break the system and accidentally displace certain information. Um, it's also thinking about if you're going to a website, for instance, and it has that angry, like, oh, this is HTTP, excuse me, HTTP, is no HTTPS, are you sure you wanna to go to this website? It doesn't seem safe. That is a sort of system, um, in my opinion, system and integrity, system and information integrity, you're letting the person on the other end know like, hey, some things might not be completely like cool. Um, and so it's up to us to make sure we go through the processes to make sure that that integrity is still in place and intact and it's trustworthy in the grand scheme of things. I think supply risk change management is my last one. Um, so cool, no misdefinition here, no big deal. Um, the way I look at it is trusting where you obtain your products from. Um, you don't want to buy something that you already know could be faulty or could have um, potential back doors in it. Um, you can get a risk assessment or do a risk assessment. So thinking a lot about vendor management, for instance, that could technically fall under a sort of supply chain risk management. Um, so doing that due diligence there, um, looking at your terms of services and agreements, reading those, being thorough with that and in your contracting process as a whole, um, again, to make sure that you are not accidentally um, signing things that could ultimately poke holes in your system security when they you literally just got it, which is not the best thing, but there are also ways around that. So with that, that is literally <laughs> all I think 20 or 25 different control families at like lightning speed and I had not been looking at questions but I am going to pop over and look at questions in a moment um but if you want to follow me on the social medias I have them I have my LinkedIn which is a link there but I'm also happy to share it in the chat um I am also on the Twitters at Sundersec that's my little um avatar so shout out to pick me or pick crew.me where I got that made um Feel free to follow me on the social medias. I talk about a lot of different stuff up there that is totally not all security related, but I'm there. Um, for my references, I wanna say thank you so much to the WOC in tech chat for all of my stock photos that have lovely pictures of black women doing the thing in tech. It brings me so much joy. Obviously I also use NIST 853 as well as the NIST glossary to try and pull my definitions from. And I wanna say thank you. Thank you to you all who showed up for my chat. Um, thank you to my team who blasted this on the Twitters and the social medias and at work. Um, I wanna say thank you to the Diana Initiative for giving me a chance to do this chat. I very much appreciate the shot. Um, and I also want to plug, since I'm here, that my company that I work at is hiring. Um, if you go to gusto, G-U-S-T-O dot com slash careers, and I'll put that in the chat. Not only are we hiring throughout the company as a whole and throughout engineering, but the security team is hiring quite a bit. I think we are actually hiring on each security team that we have. So would love to talk to you about our different roles that we have. Love to talk to you about whatever um again so yeah that that's me and i really did go count by 30 minutes so i'm super great um but yeah i'm gonna look at things so brie i don't i i'm going to try and scroll through the chat really fast hey uh i've been paying attention to chat here on the side um so one of the first questions that was asked uh, was if a company doesn't have a GRC team, uh, what's the best way to get about uh, starting that up? That is a great question. I think a lot of it comes down to also making sure when talking about GRC, it's are you talking about GRC from a strict security standpoint or is it going to be GRC at the company level? Once you kind of have that cleared out a little bit, and I'll talk about it for the sake of security because this is a security conference. Um, going through and trying to almost do a risk assessment to understand what is most important to the company um, and what's most important to your security team and then understanding what industry that you're in. So if you work in the healthcare industry, for instance, going through and understanding what 
HIPAA compliance, and I put air quotations around it because there is technically no such thing as HIPAA compliance, um, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but understanding what HIPAA is actually asking for and modeling controls around that. So you can go through that and do the same thing with NIST and looking at the different control families and say, okay, cool. If AC1, which I know what AC1 is, which is access control one is saying, do you have an access control policy? Um, and you can start in that route and just kind of understanding like, what are the things, what are the problems that I'm trying to solve for in a security standpoint and start building controls around that and like using this as a reference point. Hopefully that helped. <laughs> I'm so sorry if that's kind of like my scattered brain googly answer. Yeah, as another point to that question, let's say they wanted to focus on using uh, NIST 853. Uh, any starting points or any recommendations for them and such? Because I know that's kind of like you have to get a team, then you have to have some folks kind of start driving the adoption and everything, especially with leadership and everything else. So it's very much a multi-pronged battle there. If I were trying to, I don't want to be like, go read it because I literally do this talk so people don't have to go read it. Um, I would actually say still, hmm, NIST always asks you to start with policies and I, I falter on that. Policies are cool, but you shouldn't create policies for the sake of like, you shouldn't create policies that you can't actually adhere to. That's what I'm trying to say. I don't know. I'm just going to say I don't know, to be quite honest, which is not the best answer. <laughs> but if you want to add me on social media, because now I'm probably going to think about this for the rest of the day. And I'll have it. It's in. always organization specific, depending on your verticals and your business needs and everything else and your leadership structure. So it, there's not one size fits all, I imagine, for this type of stuff, especially when you're trying to apply it to an entire organization that's already in motion, has its own things going on there at that point. Um, someone else said, asked as a quick question, uh, were you going to be uh, sharing slides for this or would they be available elsewhere? I am going to share my slides. Um, that is something that I've been waiting to do until I finish this one presentation. So literally probably today, I am going to upload them onto my LinkedIn and I will try and find other places to also share them because then I think that could address the, the first question of, hey, if you want to read through the slides and try and assess what makes the most sense for you on where to start, then we could totally, totally do that. Yeah, um, so we had a handful of other questions here uh, towards the bottom of the chat. Um, NIST 853 recommends monitoring. Does it provide guidance on how to go about monitoring systems? I do believe this does go about actually saying like how to monitor systems themselves. Um, it's been a while since I've actually poked through the system and monitoring because I've gotten I've gotten away from using NIST as much as my starting point, and now I have like years of experience um, to go through and be like, oh, this is what you should be monitoring for. NIST does index a lot on saying like, if you have a low system, this is what we would like to see um, if you had like an auditor come in. So the short answer is yes. Or I guess it's almost clarifying on my end to know like, oh, hey, Carla. Oh, geez, Carla. Sorry, this is my coworker who's asking this. Uh, <laughs> So yes, it does give some guidance on it and it is beneficial to have, but we could totally talk about this at work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I'm used to PCI compliance and everything, having some very in the weeds definitions about, hey, you should be doing this and that. Not telling exactly how to implement it, but giving some guidelines of what you should be going towards and such. So I honestly wasn't sure on this side. Uh, James asks, uh, when the company is a supply team for a DOD product and is required to follow this but refuses to do so, what's the best path to take? And that's a Multi-factor question there. <laughs> I like that's a loaded question. Um, let me clarify by saying I no longer work for the Department of Defense. I cannot speak on DOD's behalf. I cannot speak on anyone's behalf but myself. If I were in this boat and a particular vendor does not want to follow D uh, excuse me, NIST guidance, go find another vendor. Um, that's my personal thing. Like I'm always team, like if I have hard requirements or things that I need and they won't follow it, I'll go find someone else. If it's the rare instance, like they are somehow the only vendor who can do this one particular thing, it becomes having a conversation and be like, look, we got to meet each other halfway, um, which sucks. And it causes a lot of heartache and heartburn and talking and feelings. But realistically, if you can go find another vendor who's actually willing to follow what you need in your supply chain process, your vendor management process, risk management process, et cetera, um, go do that. It's also kind of weird and red flaggy when some companies are like, I'm just not going to do this thing. It's like, where are you hiding? Like, why won't you do this thing? Um, 
But that's, again, a very loaded, multifaceted question. I don't work for DOD anymore, and I can't speak on anybody's behalf of my own. Uh, I see a number of other uh, comments in chat, but no explicit questions. I, I do have a handful of questions that I had uh, kind of come to mind while I was watching the presentation and such, if you want. Sure. Sure. So um, at several points during it, um, you like, this isn't actually having like an explicit definition um, for this or that. Uh, any particular reasons or is there adjacent documents that might contain definitions because uh, on those types of things? I don't know why they don't have definitions. It's actually quite fascinating to me when I was going through and like putting in the slide deck, I was expecting to see a lot more definition. Um, and I think that does point back to like me saying speaking a common language is so important in engineering and security because if you don't have that definition, then everyone's kind of like rummaging in their head to understand, well, what does supply chain risk management mean? Um, I didn't even bother to try and like Google different definitions that are specific to engineering and security. Um, but yeah, I don't know why NIST doesn't have it. And I, again, I'm not bashing this. I love NIST. It's still one of my dream goals to work with them one day. They like tweeted me on Twitter at once and it was super exciting. Um, yeah. I don't, did I actually answer your question? Uh, yeah, no, uh, I was actually going to ask as a follow-up to that. Is there any uh, NIST documents or other um, things that you didn't include like in your reference section that would be like a good complement to understanding this particular section of NIST or any good resources or such or? The NIST cybersecurity framework, so NIST CSF is something that I could actually totally be a great starting point um, for people who want to focus strictly on security and the focus is not so much like federal stuff. NIST CSF is like great for any company that just wants to have like a pretty solid security framework. Um, there's only like five areas in it. So that's already better, like five versus 20 some odd control families. Yeah. Um, I forget what all five of them are, which like makes me so sad because I used to remember like all things NIST, but then life. Um, but it talks about like, starting with identification, like you have a hard time knowing what to do in any system, any place, anything, if you don't even know like what you have there. So I think it goes identificate. I'm not even going to try and do it right now and embarrass myself. Um, but I totally recommend um, the NIST cybersecurity framework. There's also the NIST risk management framework. And I forget um, the the number that goes along with it, but it's also pretty solid as far as like how to walk yourself and your company or your team, what have you, through the risk management process um, and try and get an understanding of a foundation instead of, I think to a certain degree, doing risk assessments are okay being overly simplistic, but if you want something that's actually ro more robust, um, the risk management framework is also pretty solid. And I see Dwayne has also been like putting different things in there. And I'm also going to plug my career stuff because that's what I was yeah, please do. Um yes 830. Thanks Lane. We're hiring. There's there's a link in the chat where you could totally oh this is so cool. It's so cool seeing that little avatar there. Sorry. Uh so there was an uh two other questions in chat. Uh and do you think it matters if you follow NIST or say yes? And I think it's more of a perspective of does it really matter which one you follow as long as you're kind of following one of them and getting towards a bit more secure goal and such? So I will say something possibly spicy, considering I'm sitting here talking about this. You don't necessarily have to follow any of these. Like ultimately putting in security controls, what matters is what you're doing works for your company. And this might be over like overly uh, complicated or just like doing the most. CIS might not be addressing what you need and you can take and pick what you want out of these. I think also between this and CIS, they're technically kind of addressing two separate things. Um, if memory serves correct, like CIS, because I haven't looked at it in a while and I'm the worst, like focuses a lot on vulnerability type stuff for me versus NIST, which is kind of a crapshoot of a lot, obviously. Um, oh, there's dogs outside of my house. I'm so sorry I got typo. Um, I don't think it really matters which one you follow. If you don't even use NIST or CIS and you decide to use some different framework, okay, cool. Um, it's great whatever works for you as a company. Gotcha. And I think we had one last question here of, uh, uh, what's your opinion on moving away from calling things controls and using the term safeguards instead? Ooh, I actually like calling them safeguards. Controls has a has a very stern 
uh, feeling to it. And I think that can scare people. But at the same time, oh, yes, NIST and CIS also do map to each other. I'm actually reading the um, uh, the comments. Wow, words are really hard. And I need to do more morning talk <laughs> um, when I'm in my best like form. But anyway, it would be nice to call them safeguards. Control has a very stern feeling to it. Control makes it sound like you have to do these things. Um, and obviously, depending on if you're working in DOD and you're trying to do certain things and get systems put online, then yet some of the stuff you're definitely going to have to do in order to patch those thresholds. Um, I'd be open for safeguards. That's all uh, someone else. Oh, cat put guardrails. Um, there's options. I think it also kind of just depends on whatever makes you feel the most warm and fuzzy on the inside. I'm so used to calling them controls from my, my audit life where it's just second nature to me. And it also isn't as a uh, doomy and gloomy as it once was, because a lot of people will say, what, what's the spirit of the control? What, what's the spirit of what you're trying to accomplish was, which makes it sound significantly less stern. Yeah, I mean, also, I've, I'm on the DFRA side, and so I've come to appreciate the use of the terms because when something goes wrong and it's like, oh, the controls failed, it's just like, uh, do we have a reactor breach? Or is it just like we have a little alarm going off or anything? So Safeguard kind of gives a bit more variance in terms of what the actual response can be and everything instead of just assuming the most worst possible thing is occurring, which we often get in InfoSec, but not in every case for those types of situations. That is very true. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have any other questions coming to mind or anything else from chat. Um, was there anything else you wanted to cover or bring up over the last few minutes we had? Uh, no, like I said, thank you all so much to everyone who showed up and decided to hang out on a Saturday where I'm sure there are many other things that you could be doing, but you are here with me virtually and I can't reiterate how much that means to me. Um, I, I am eternally grateful and I am very, very thankful to you all. Yeah, if you want to hang out and chat, thank you also for the compliments. I'm glad you all enjoyed it. I I very much am like, I am not in my best form today. Um, but that's okay, because not every day is perfect, and that's fine. You know, I'll say just looking at chat, uh, James' comment of just calling things bubble wrap as a way of protecting it is, uh, you know, fragile, but, you know, still resilient at that point. Uh, kind of like that a bit. <laughs> Bumper controls. Um, but yeah, I think we're good at this point. Um, so thank you all so much for joining us. And we have another talk coming out in about 10 or so minutes and such. Perfect. Thank you all so much. Have a fantastic day.